You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Today's episode contains references to graphic material and adult content. On our show today, we have Tim Courtois, who's a licensed professional counselor in Michigan in the United States. Tim has been practicing for 15 years, specializing in work related to sexuality. In the year 2020, Tim wrote a piece for Quillette, where he discusses his experience at a program, the University of Michigan in sexual health. And we are here to talk today with Tim about that experience and to dive into what counselor education around sexuality looks like these days. So Tim, thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So where do you want to start? I mean, there's there's a lot in your piece that I want to get to, but perhaps we should go a little further back to get some context on, you know, why you decided to sign up for this program. My understanding is that you were already an LPC, a licensed counselor at that point. Is that right? Yeah, I had been practicing for, well, since 2006. I, I, I signed up for the program in 2019. Um, and I had all for, for many years been, um, well, been, fascinated by and interested in sexuality and the role that it plays in our lives, not just, you know, as a therapist, but, but personally, um, really interested in sexuality as a, a, a central, uh, place where humans find meaning for their lives. And, and that had always been really an important piece of my work, especially, um, in my work with college students, I, I had ended up finding a lot of clients who had um, stories of sexual harm or, or some form of, of sexual wounding or trauma. And so that had been a really main uh, part of, of my work uh, for many years. Um, and uh, so, you know, in 2019, I had, let's say I, I was looking to get more deeply connected with um, just the whole, the profession as a whole, like what, how are we engaging with sexuality? I was aware that there was like a lot of cultural shifts happening and then there were shifts happening in my own understanding and belief system. And I was in a place where I was looking to connect with other professionals who were learning about these things, engaging with these things, asking deep questions with curiosity and openness. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So when I found out there was this program at the University of Michigan that was very prestigious, it was connected to ASACT, which is the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, and so I found out, gosh, this is right in my backyard. It's a prestigious program. It's a year long. It draws people internationally. And I thought, gosh, what luck. This is the perfect thing for me. And not really knowing much exactly what I was getting into, I signed up and was accepted to the program. And were you were you thinking, uh, I'm sorry for my lack of knowledge because I, I don't know ASEC, I, I'm from Ireland, but it, were you thinking you'd be a sex therapist or something wider? Were you you know, I didn't feel uh, committed to any one thing. You know, uh, in my mind, like everything is human, you know, and, and every human has sexuality and is, is, is wrestling with his issues of sexuality, even if it's not their primary presenting problem. So I was open to the idea that I would become a sex therapist in the sense of working with, let's say couples or individuals who are dealing with specific sexual problems in their life. But really, I mean, I, I love just wrestling with existential issues more broadly and, and that's always going to intersect with people's sexuality. And so even, you know, wherever that would lead for me professionally, I knew it would be interesting and worthwhile. Okay. And was it a diploma or a degree or a master's or was it? Certificate. The program is called okay. the, the Sexual Health Certificate. And it was specifically with a specialty in um, sex therapy and sexuality education. So it mm -hmm. had both those, you know, it was for therapists and sexuality educators. And before we get into your experience in this program, I just want to kind of comment that ASECT is like the premier, I guess, 
uh, organization or body that is the authority on sex education and sex therapy. So this is not just some kind of fringe group. This is like the main thing. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is that fair to say? Is that my understanding is right? That's, that's my understanding. And, and you know, when I started to Google around, you know, I mean, you, you do searches on the Internet and you find a zillion different organizations and it's hard mm-hmm. to know, like, gosh, how prominent is this? Um, but even just when I heard the name, uh, you know, I was thinking, gosh, this sounds perfect for me. I'm really interested in sexuality education and you know how do we communicate about these things how do we teach about these things and clearly i'm I'm a therapist and and interested in how we address sexuality as therapists so it it seemed like the perfect fit yeah and they were established in the 60s so this this organization has been around for a while so why don't you um tell us about your experience in the program so just to recap like you're you're so curious about the existential issues and just like this deep, profound human way that sexuality intersects with all of our lives. And so you're going to this program hoping to get just more rich understanding of these questions. And then (laughs) this kind of does connect with my own personal story some because I have been involved in in working as a therapist for a, uh, a relatively conservative Christian church for many years up until 2018. And I had gone through, you know, some deconstructions in my own belief system in my life and had left that position at a church. And so even as I was looking to get connected to the profession more broadly, um, I was really looking to re-engage questions of, gosh, how do I understand sexuality? What is this stuff really all about? How do we understand gender? And and those questions were really heating up in our culture as well and, and causing a lot of waves. And so I was thinking, oh, great, this could be a place where we could have some really meaningful, thoughtful discussion and exploration um, with other professionals who are wanting to really ask these questions deeply. And I really just right away, and, and in fact, my, my experience having been in a um, – somewhat like unhealthy or rigid church system before became very informative because as soon as the program started, I was kind of hit in the face with this really familiar feeling that kind of raised the hackles on my back. Just like there was a a very, um, a, a sense of indoctrination. There was a sense that there are, there are right answers that we're here to tell you. And there's an ethos that you need to say certain things and believe certain things and not question certain things that was being pushed from the very beginning. Could, could I ask you about your first day? Because I, I saw you talk about it before and it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the first part of the program uh, was the SAR, which is the SAR, they call it the Sexual Attitude Reassessment um, and this uh, uh, is a common seminar that, that people go through and the, the the, the goal of it is to um, uh, have people encounter all the different kinds of um, uh, experiences of sexuality or presentations of sexuality or types of sexuality that they're going to encounter professionally and give them a chance to examine what are their presuppositions or, or prejudices and become more open and understanding and curious about each of these different different things which on the surface was a great a great idea a great purpose a, a, a great way to start the program but it was really um a weekend of kind of we're all sitting in a, in a room and just being sort of bludgeoned over the head with pornographic videos and pornographic stories and um especially with a, with a huge focus on um, BDSM, uh, which stands for uh, bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism. Um, and the push was really to utterly normalize everything, to be accepting and see how beautiful and wonderful and good and amazing all of this is. Um, it was really, um, I would say, desensitizing, um, uh, th- there was this sense that you you just have to look at all of this and celebrate it and and just sort of uh, delu- be deluged. We were really firehosed, I think, with all of this different content. Um, 
in a in a pretty I think overwhelming way. So you were to, uh, your your sexual attitude reassessment was was basically um, what watching porn and BDSM with an emphasis of BDSM and saying this is a normal sex um, attitude or this is a normal sex life. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't want to straw man the presentation. I mean, there's an element of that that gave us an opportunity to, you know, you know, if someone had never had any understanding of or experience with BDSM before, it was a chance to sort of look into that and see, you know, there were interviews as well, personal stories of people who were involved in these different um, presentations, you know, whether it's BDSM or polyamory. um, uh, There was even aspects of uh, talking about pedophilia so people who experience attraction to to minors um uh and so to 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 look into these personal experiences and and understand them rather than just having a a distant sort of judgment about them on the surface that that's a good thing to be able yeah, to do yeah it's it's a really good question because when somebody comes to me as a therapist and they use porn and I, I, I'm not sure what I think, because I think, you know, there's an interesting concept called ethical porn mm-hmm. uh, that's arising. I think erotica seems to have lost its day, sadly, because I think erotica could could be brought back in and kind of it has its place. And then a lot of people say are very anti-porn. And some of the anti-porn people are very progressive thinkers and some of the anti-porn are very uh, narrow-minded thinkers. So it's it's a big subject. So I can see why they went there. I'm not sure why the emphasis was on BDSM, though. Yeah, it, it was. I was I was struck by that, like how much, not just in that first weekend, but throughout the whole program, we were going there again and again and again. There was a real fixation in particular on um on trans issues and BDSM. Those seem to take up a lot of the bandwidth in the program. May, may I just interject with a hypothesis? I mean, yeah. on the ASECT website, it, it has all of the kind of buzzwords that we're getting really familiar with, like marginalized groups yes. and safe spaces for identities that are underrepresented. So if BDSM has not been culturally accepted and discussed in like your typical health education curriculum, then they're going to take it up and they're going to center it. It says centering yes. marginalized something or others. So that's why the most underrepresented, let's say, quote unquote, sexual behaviors or experiences, polyamory, BDSM, all of this uh, has to be the center focus of, mm. of these types of educational programs. Yeah, and in, in itself, I, I don't think that's entirely wrong. Though, I'm, I mean, you know, if you're if you're trying to educate therapists, I think it's really important to say let's educate them and equip them for the things that they're also most likely to see. So I feel like there those things can be at cross purposes. You know, on the one hand, you want to focus on the things that are most common. On the other hand, you don't want to ignore and further marginalize people who have been marginalized. But Stella, I think that you know the question you were just bringing up about porn, where like there's a lot of complexity there and there are people on various sides, you know, in terms of how they assess that morally and how do you, how do you suss out what is ethical and what's not ethical here? What I had hoped for in the program is, yeah, we can have a, um, a non-judgmental and yet thoughtful conversation that acknowledges values are an important part of the human experience And so we're not here to indoctrinate you with a specific set of values, but we have to acknowledge that values exist. So let's be adults and professionals who can discuss these things thoughtfully. Instead, there was this sense of we must normalize and accept everything. And and so it became this um, drumbeat throughout the program of a moral opposition to moral values. It is morally wrong to make moral judgments about anything at all. That was really troubling. And further, there's another side to porn that occurs to me that it's it's having sex with a disconnected kind of uh, manner, mm-hmm. and psychologically that not, not might not be as as nutritious or nourishing for you you as having sex with a a deeper connection. And mm-hmm. I'm not giving a moral judgment on that. I'm giving a. I wonder if if if. If if sex is just portrayed as something that we do as animals and there is no deeper connection, are we losing something 
is it right to see it like that? I'm not sure. I, I think we might be losing something. And so to just act as if this is just akin to going to the toilet, really, it's a, it's a yes. purely biological function. I think a lot is being lost, I think. Yeah, there is a real like, you know, it's supposed to be a, a an attitude reassessment, but it became, as I said before, a desensitization. There's a there was a sense in that specifically that first seminar that we had that weekend um, that if you have any averse responses or, or sensitivity to any of these things, that sensitivity needs to be um you know, sort of drowned out. And when in fact, I would say that sensitivity might actually be a really significant component of what sexuality is all about. We're sensitive. We can be touched. We can be impacted. Oh. And, and that's what it's all about. The, the sort of dialogical interactive relationship in which we can move other people and be moved by other people. So to say all of that sensitivity that might make you say, whoa, this is too much. I want, I need to pause for a moment. Let me step back from this. I don't want to be beaten over the head with just image after image after image and video after video. Um, well, that's just because you're moralistic or judgmental and need to have your attitudes reassessed. <laughs> and you might be sent, you might have a sense of reaction to somebody having their testicles clamped or their nipples clamped and that might be purely your, your own sense. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. It doesn't have to be any moral judgment. It might be just like a, a flinching reflex that is perfectly fine for each person to have, I think. Stella, you're talking about videos that were shown in the program where yeah. uh, like some dominatrix person, I think, was clamping a, a man's testicles or something like that. And you were asked to watch this video. And this is just, you know, reminding me of what we discussed in our last episode was that when we try to constantly buck norms and be subversive with our behaviors, it can disconnect us from our instinct. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's you're so right, Tim, about sexuality being something so sensitive. I mean, it's such a an intense thing to be um, in tune with your own desires and how your body and mind responds to the touch of another person or some kind of vulnerable moment. And it's incredibly sensitive. And so I find it really odd that rather than, you know, lifting up the fact that, you know, different people are aroused by different things, and that's a that is a personal experience for whatever reason people have arousal. It's their own personal history, their own experiences around sexuality, but that every therapist should be desensitized. I mean, it's almost like a, a forgetting too that the therapists and the programs themselves are beings that have mm -hmm. their own sexual comfort levels and history and, I also just can't help but think that it seems like the program forgot to take into account that coercive sexual experiences can have a really lasting impact on people's ability to be vulnerable and to tolerate different levels of sexual aggression, let's say. So it just, it strikes me as very odd that that important aspect of human sexuality, which is Mm -hmm. that some people have been through abusive sexual experiences just kind of got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. And, and there was, it, you know, there was certainly in the program discussion of sexual trauma, but I think there was also a real avoidance of, or let's say even a prohibition against talking about the fact that the trauma you've experienced can shape the things that you're drawn towards in the present. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say specifically with BDSM, there is the sense that like, if we pathologize something, then we're not allowed to be curious about it, which I think is silly because everything has health and beauty in it and everything has pathology in it. And so we have to be able to acknowledge that complexity and be curious at the same time. But since they were saying we can't be curious about it if we pathologize it, then therefore we have to say that this is all utterly healthy and good and wonderful and beautiful, and there's no room for questioning that. So, you know, another one of the examples from that SAR was, you know, we watched a video of an interview with a, with a dominatrix um, 
or a dom, the male version of a dominatrix, uh, who was describing the story of a man who had come to him and paid him and said, what I want you to do is I want you to tie me up and then I want you to beat me. And I want you to beat me until I scream and protest. And I'm going to be very, very upset. And I don't want you to stop no matter what I do, no matter what I say, I don't want you to stop. And so this man was then telling how he, he proceeded to do that. He beat the man and the man was screaming and screaming until at some point the man just went limp and kind of became catatonic. And at that point, the dom uh, unbound the man and the man began to weep and cry and wail in his arms. And the dom held him while he, while he wailed and comforted him. And again, the class was just kind of united in this celebration of, oh, how beautiful, how wonderful, what an incredible, beautiful experience. And I'm just thinking, my goodness, there's something deeply, deeply troubling here. Are we not allowed to say that? Are we not allowed to acknowledge that or even be curious about it? And did you say anything there? Oh, my goodness. I Did I say anything at that time? I don't think I did. There were times in the program where I did speak up at different things, but I, I don't recall. I think at that point, honestly, in that first weekend, I was taking in the atmosphere and was pretty much in shock. And I'd say probably desensitized, like kind of just, I think I'd kind of gone stoic myself at that point. I remember, Tim, when you and I first met and you told me that story and I think I cried, and then I read it in Quillette, and I think I cried, and right now you're telling it, I just can't stop my emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. If we can't hear that story and recognize that something profoundly important and possibly terrifying is probably lurking in this man's history, Mm -hmm. something is wrong. We as therapists have done something really wrong. If our responsibility to have a hypothesis and possibly interpret what is the pain that clients are bringing to us. Like just something is so wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible, it's an incredible story. And I just, I imagine there were lots of other people in that room that probably had a similar internal reaction as you did, Mm -hmm. but maybe just felt also kind of numbed out from the week or, a little bit nervous to say anything. Yes. Got the message that, I mean, th- there was a oh, something in the ethos of the program that gave you a sense pretty quickly of what questions you could ask and what questions you couldn't ask. And so I discussed this a little bit in the article, but it was a regular experience in the program for me where I would speak up and say something or ask a question that was a maybe um, <laughs> a breaking with, the tone of the program a little bit and Mm -hmm. afterwards somebody would come up to me and sort of kind of hushed tones whisper like thank you for asking that question i i was thinking the same thing i feel like i can't speak up here am i Mm -hmm. right i think this would have been a room of therapists watching this yes therapists and mostly therapists some of them were um, medical professionals or people who are in a position to provide education in some way to patients it just feels shocking to me, like us three are therapists and we all, you wouldn't need to be Freud to kind of read that story <laughs> and yeah. say there's, there's more going on here than just a BDSM urge to be hit. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that there's more going on. It's, it's clearly got layers and something needs to be attended to and perhaps there might be better ways to attend to it. And I, I just, it's this feeling, I, I sometimes feel horror struck at my profession, that there was a room full of therapists nodding along and didn't en masse say, wait, we've got training. We, we, know, we know how to look under the, under the lid here. Yeah, it's a real test case in how do ideologies that have some real problems with them spread even though they have those problems. You know, I, I, I think there were a certain number of people in the program who were troubled and who you know, we're in private with themselves thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on here? But there were certainly enough participants in the program who were fully bought in. And I think probably knew in advance what they'd be getting. Maybe they knew more about ASACT or knew more about the U of M program than I did. And they were already speaking the language. I mean, all of it was very, very woke. Um, You know, so it was just 
again, a- another thing is the steady drumbeat of the language of power, oppression, privilege that was constant. Um, every class, every lecture, that was a main component of what we were discussing. May, and, m- may I ask, how woke were you or not woke were you just before you started the program? Like, how wide-eyed were you to <laughs> this whole world of woke? Uh, not woke. <laughs> I'll say not woke. But here's the funny thing is, given the deconstruction I had gone through in my own life, you know, I had been sort of coming out of this very conservative realm and had seen, sort of had my eyes open to a lot of the unhealth in my own, you know, what my own little subculture was. And so in a sense, I was very winnable. I was looking for something new. I was saying, gosh, there was more craziness in my realm than I knew. And I'm troubled by that. And I want to connect with something different. And um, gosh, maybe I'll find something good here. Maybe I'll find wisdom here. So I was really wanting to be on board. And, um, but like I said, so quickly, I just saw a dark mirror of the religious indoctrinating kind of semi-cultish um, atmosphere that I, that was familiar to me that I just, I, I, there was a real like withdrawing from that, like, oh my gosh, this is the same thing, except these people hate religion and they're Mm -hmm. constantly attacking and, and, um, making critiques of people who, who are religious or moral or moralizing, um, uh, I mean, that was explicitly said, like, you know, that to be moralizing about sex is wrong, which is just a self-contradictory statement because it's a moral statement. <laughs> um, and yet there was such a religious atmosphere to the program. I was like, gosh, y- you guys aren't really different than what I came from. And in many ways, you're worse. This is really. So I was I was not woke is the answer. But I was. And did you come open. from a kind of Christian Catholic and was the darkness you speak about sex abuse and things or am I jumping? To um, no, um, the darkness. Oh, gosh, that's a whole that's a whole nother uh, rabbit trail. The darkness was, I'd say, like um, spiritual coercion and, and um, you know, unhealthy relationships and, and power dynamics that were just became a really controlling atmosphere. Um, similar in the, to what I'm talking about with the program in the sense that there was a lot that was not explicitly said, but that you pick up, you know, you sort of know what's allowed and what's not. And that becomes a very controlling force. And even, um, in some ways, it's more powerful than if it were explicit because it it becomes a way that you end up policing yourself, mm-hmm. and and it can be very hard to see when you're when you're inside of it. So, I mean, we're we're of course going to link your piece in the show notes, but as an overview, we've touched on some of the aspects of this program. But I mean, were there discussions of you know, like what relationship dynamics are like? Because if you're going to talk about sexuality, my my assumption is that you're going to talk about human <laughs> relationships, you know, and like intimacy, connection, distance. I mean, was there a rich conversation or any conversation around that? Or was it just about sex as like some mechanical organ stimulation activity? Because yeah. sometimes that's how these programs sound to me. It was there was some discussion of intimacy and relationships. I would not call it rich. And I would say it was um, a relatively minor component of the program, Um, you know, uh, confined to like a couple courses throughout. And, and even those courses would be more heavily weighted on the sort of, uh, you know, power, oppression and privilege Mm -hmm. and systemic injustice stuff. So it was mostly, as you're saying, kind of the mechanical stuff. And, um, you know, sex is a way for people to express their own personal desire for pleasure and um, to sort of do and choose whatever they want. But the discussion of, you know, relational dynamics and, uh, you know, I I would say marriage, but even if it's not, you know, in a literal sense confined to, you know, a traditional marriage, like, long-term relationships uh that that was not a a strong focus of the program at all and even when we did talk about it it wasn't um 
oh, there wasn't a lot of space for real deep questioning and, and dialoguing. Like that, I think that's what I was really hoping for in the program because to me it's like, okay, the mysteries of relationship and masculinity and femininity and sexuality, gosh, that stuff is endlessly mysterious and I would love to talk about that with mm-hmm. other people who are also interested in it. Um, and we just never got there. Yeah. It felt, it seems like it was pretty surface. I mean, some of the things you mentioned in the article was, you know, that gender identity dictates status in law and that any differences between boys and girls are, you know, culturally imposed, you know, Mm -hmm. that violence is a normal part of sexuality. I mean, there are so many things like polyamory, sex work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a list of kind of political statements that are being taught as therapy programs. So I don't know, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about the messaging around gender and gender identity, since, since of course, that's what Stella and I focus in mm-hmm, our work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was a big push to um, relativize everything, like you said, that, um, uh, you know, all gender roles are culturally imposed. And, you know, it's weird because, and, and I think this is something you do address on your podcast. There are these underlying contradictions in there because there's some sense in which the politics of gender, you know, simultaneously reinforce traditional stereotypes and at the same time make it anathema to talk about the ways in which traditional ideas might actually have some validity. So there's, you know, um, like, you know, if you like music and dancing, then you're a girl in a boy's body. Um, or, you know, so it, it, unless you're Barbie or Rambo, you're trans mm-hmm. um, or at least non-binary or whatever the particular label might be. And um, so, so all that stuff really falls into these stereotypes. And then at the same time, we're, we're expected to say that the gender roles are completely socially constructed and it's all really then meaningless and you end up kind of swimming in this totally subjective sea where nothing has any meaning and there's nothing you can even find any grounding on. Um, and, and there, that one of the things that was especially pushed hard throughout the program was when we were talking about trans issues um, was with kids, we need to be affirming. We need to, the, you know, they need to be given easy access to puberty blockers. We can't challenge their identity. They need, you know, you know, if they want cross-sex hormones, that that has to be something that they have the freedom to choose. There was a weird contradiction because, you know, the it was going back to like the morality within the program. There was a discussion all the time of the only moral precept we're allowed to accept is consent. Consent, consent, consent. As long as it's consensual, it's good. Um, But then when we talked about pedophilia, they said, well, that's a little different. Children cannot consent. Um, And there was no real explanation for that. That was just asserted. There was no sort of, um, there was no real argument there. Children could consent to uh, cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers, but they couldn't consent to sex. Yeah, yeah. And again, that so so there was just this, talking out of both sides of their mouths and saying, okay, now with, with regard to, I mean, the, the, the line in the article that the reason why I remember it is because like, just when this thought like, struck me, it really, like, I couldn't get out of my brain that like, so if a child wants to have their genitals stimulated by an adult, their consent, you know, they're not, you say they're not able to give consent because they're a child, but if a child wants to have their genitals cut off by an adult, you're obligated to follow yeah wow. it's so formulaic i mean it's so s- superficial and it's like you know color by numbers kind of thing it doesn't really encourage any profound questioning or you know deep mm-hmm. philosophy here this is all really superficial I-, I guess like one thing that comes to my mind is that we often are contacted by parents whose child might be struggling with gender and they're looking for a trained clinician. And I'm just thinking about, you know, if a clinician was trained in a program like this yes. and hadn't really critically examined any of what they're taught, then that, that explains how we're getting so many kids just being affirmed and pushed into transition. Absolutely. I, it's like I got a glimpse behind the scenes of where therapists are fed these stock lines that then they're 
they're then told to go and share with children and parents, like, you know, threatening parents that if you don't affirm your child, your child will commit suicide. The line was literally, you know, if you, if you have a child who was born a boy and now says that they're a girl, you know, do you want a dead son or a live daughter? That's what you say to the parents to convince them to accept that their child is not who they thought their child was. And yet that's been, that's been thrown out now, like as a, as a concept that like the, the, the suicidality of this cohort is no higher than other people with mental health issues. And mm. certain mental health issues have a much higher mortality rate, like anorexia. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm shocked that it took hold and I'm shocked that that, that whole line hasn't just been absolutely mm swept mm-hmm. out like because you you're talking only two years ago they were saying this in, in all seriousness that one year ago <laughs> wow we're in america Stella. it's just different here in america <laughs> it's like a different planet it's just so yeah. not true and it needs to be emphasized it's not true that the, the suicidality of this cohort is not anything extraordinary it's it's a vulnerable group because they and have this... certain issues and it, it falls in with vulnerable groups it's it's no higher And similar with, you know, the idea that, say, puberty blockers are a perfectly safe um, way for children who are struggling with gender identity to just have a pause button. And they can go on puberty blockers and anytime they want, they can go off and puberty will resume as normal with no side effects, no problems. I mean, that was pushed really hard. And now therapists say that because they learned it from programs like this and the the piece that's especially troubling to me, I mean, I care about all of this as a therapist, but then because the program is especially pushing sexuality education as well, they're actively training sexuality educators who will then go into public schools and be teaching these sorts of things to, you know, elementary school kids. What's really sad to me is that like when we got rid of this shame around sex, we could have got into a great era where, where sex became something gorgeous and, a kind of a, a lovely, connecting, beautiful part of life. And developing sexuality could have been something that was really a, an exciting journey that we go on. And it's it seems to have been grabbed and warped mm-hmm. and mangled so that a, a developing sexuality has been stamped out. It's, it's extraordinary. I do know statistically children, or I shouldn't say children, teenagers are having less sex now than almost any other generation, they're really uh, uh, disconnected from their sex uh, drive mm-hmm. and their sex, their growing sexuality. And not only that, people in their 20s aren't having sex. And it's a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a worrying kind of, that they aren't having great sex. And what they're doing is talking about sex a lot. Talking well, about virtual. Like, yeah, virtual. They're having loads of virtual sex, but it's like having virtual anything. It's, it's not as good. And it needs to be sang. It's just not as good. You can have as much virtual sex as you want. And I've had enough clients tell me, oh, no, I'm having a great sex life. It's all virtual. And I would say, no, it's not. It's not as good because you are missing out. And if you don't know the difference between uh, the, 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 the extraordinary strength and, and, and richness of real sex and you think virtual sex is as good, you don't know what you're missing is what I would say. Mm-hmm. Well said. The beauty of it is so important. And that's what I had hoped for is like, gosh, this is going to be probably a program full of people who are very passionate about sexuality and and the beauty that's possible there. And I think some of that was present. I don't want to just, you know, paint the whole program and everyone in it with one brush. But I think mostly it was the the passion for wokeness and for deconstructing and and overturning you know, traditional narratives. Um, it was mostly what they're against, not what they're passionate about and what they're for. And to piggyback on what you were saying, Stella, that like, not only are they not encountering the beauty of sex, but like that beauty of sex is embedded in beautiful relationships. And since relationship was de-emphasized, there's such a loss. I, I was really fascinated by how many people in the program were unmarried not parents, don't have interest in getting married or being parents. And in some cases, a lot of people nowadays even see like like they see it as immoral to bring children into the world. And yet at the same time, extremely focused on we need to find kids and teach them these things and make them think these things. 
So that was really striking, the, the fixation on educating children, even as there is a revulsion to to having children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so bizarre. I mean, that really stood out to me when I was thinking about this program. And, you know, lest we be um, kind of fundamentalist about it, but like, it's like they didn't get the memo that like sex typically leads to having children. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there's such a fundamental connection between the desire of wanting somebody, wanting to physically connect with them, and then the possibility of procreating and having a family. And I mean, of course, ironically, we've also had, you know, LGB rights working so hard over decades so that gay couples can also get married and have children and raise children. And and there seems to be like a just kind of a missed mm -hmm. opportunity there to connect the dots. Not that you have to have children in order to have sex or vice versa, but well, yes, vice versa. You do have to have sex with children. <laughs> but, but it's just, it's interesting. It, everything is so compartmentalized and yeah. destructed that you kind of miss the big picture of like, well, what is this thing? And I just want to also highlight that, Stella, you mentioned earlier a comment about sex just being this animalistic thing. But ironically, I think this entire approach to sexuality removes us from our animal instincts like mm. from working with young people i know that even when they are engaging in sexual activities together it feels so unintuitive like i think they have a conversation beforehand about what acts they can and cannot do with each other what they consent to I know. and then they're like okay let's have at it but like i don't <laughs> sense that there's you know that magic where you're like mm. saying to someone you get the tingle in your stomach and you get a little flushed like i'm sure it happens to some degree but it's so much more mechanical it's mm -hmm. so much more transactionary yeah you lose the dance you lose the dance uh, and you also, to be a bit more brutal, you lose animal passion as well. <laughs> exactly. You, know, you, 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 you lose a whole lot. You lose a lot of raw sexual um, energy that could yeah. be very exciting and very um, invigorating and, and important and wild and also very animalistic. It's, yeah. You're right. I've, I've, I've heard teenagers talk about sex and it's like awfully depressing <laughs> oh my god and I, god bless them they're, they're trying to do consent clearly very indoctrinated by it's all about consent 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 power and oppression and let's forget about our animal instinct that i fancy you and you fancy me and let's see where that takes us none of that is going on the spontaneity kind of has disappeared I, I, I don't want to blame bad teen sex entirely on this ideology. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true. <laughs> nobody imagine, is. Nobody there, is. Uh, there have probably kind of always <laughs> been a lot of really insecure teenagers having terrible sex with each totally, other. Totally, <laughs> totally, totally. Let's be careful. <laughs> Maybe there always will be. Maybe my idea that we were all going to have this. You know, in 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 Ireland, we all thought the Swedes people from Sweden were very liberated and we were all going to have sex like Swedes once we got rid of the Catholic Church and <laughs> freed ourselves. And it never happened. It never happened. But you know, there's something really like delicate about the process of kids growing into their sexuality, you know, where like, I mean, I, got, I remember like when I was in middle school and all the kids going to the roller rink and there are these awkward skates together and, Oh my God, can you believe Nick kissed Susie? And like, like, uh, and, and it's this, this gradual clumsy, hopefully guided, but gently guided process where people grow up into the capacity to do that beautiful dance together. And there's this desire to um, flood kids as early as possible with everything and and if we do that then they'll be totally unconstrained and free to make choices and do only what they consent and and be sort of the master of their own destinies without being oppressed by all these sort of patriarchal tyrannical systems of oppression that limit us and that loses sight it sort of blames all of it on this tyrannical patriarchy or whatever westernism or whatever your enemy of the day is and forgets the fact that, well, damn, being a human is just really complicated. 
And sexuality is insanely complicated, and we sort of have to work our way into it and learn over time. And it's just clumsy. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is important because you talked about this idea of like, just like flooding kids with information, and mm. I I think it's so hard. You know, I I remember like my mom telling me about how little information she got about sexuality when she was young, just because it was really taboo, and the thought at the time was like, well, you know, don't tell kids about it or they'll go do it. Mm. And then on the other hand, like the the other swing of the pendulum goes to this like blasting kids, like waterboarding them with sexual information really, really young. Mm -hmm. And and those are both unhealthy approaches. I mean, I always say the truth usually lies somewhere in the middle. And so I like what you said about Tim, about gently guided sexuality development. And I wonder, you know, we've of course picked apart the aspects of this program that we disagree with, but like, what if, what if we could just spend some time talking about what is a vision of healthy way to gently usher kids into that direction Mm -hmm. of like independence and, you know, having the capacity for a rich, meaningful, like intimate life. How, how would we envision that? I'm not sure I have a great answer for it, but are there maybe things about our generation that we found valuable that were done or not done that helped us kind of along that path? Like, what do you guys think? Oh, that is such a big question, Sasha. <laughs> and and I, I feel like there's really different levels of answers to that question because like in this program and in my life recently, I've been thinking a lot about, what should that look like from a public education standpoint? You know, what yeah. systems can you employ to make sure kids have access to good information? But all of this is going to be done much better on on the family level, you know, where people have close relationships with their children and they can listen and pay attention and bring guidance and, gosh, have conversation. So I, I feel like those are two very different realms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'd be very, I do think we shouldn't do it the way we're doing it now because sexuality seems to be something to be talked about and intellectualized rather than felt. Mm-hmm. And it would be nicer if, if there was more, um, less talk and uh, more emphasis on it being a private kind of growth within you, your your sexuality it develops and it's it's a lovely thing. And to make friends with your own sexuality first might be a better way forward. But I, I really don't think there's anything out there. I, I really don't think there's anything out there for the, like you say, you're either going to be waterboarded with information or it's suppressed and you have nothing. And the, the, mm. the medium ground seems to be really, well, it certainly wasn't in this course that you you would have taken. I would have loved the sound of the course as well myself, Tim, and I, I, I'm sure I would have been interested in it. And it, it just sounds like something out of Clockwork Orange, what you what you ended up at. <laughs> it felt that way. Yeah, um, Sasha, to to maybe say more of an answer to your question, I think about and and here I'm drawing a little bit from my Christian backgrounds, like the the concept of marriage as a sacrament and the sacrament is sort of a a concrete experience through which you get a window into something more eternal and cosmic and meaningful in a broader way if a child grows up in an atmosphere where they see every day two adults who are living out that dance mm-hmm. with beauty and intimacy and they they see you know conflict and complexity and delight and play and affection. And they also have the intuition that there's something deeper going on behind the scenes that they don't have access to, but they see, you know, you know, one parent kisses the other one or hugs the other one or whatever the case may be, you know, there's, there's um, affection there. There's a hint that something else is going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That I think, becomes this sort of timeless invitation for the child into the idea that, gosh, there's something deeper that will become available to me as I grow older. And, and then I become curious about the, 
the feelings I have and the intuitions I have as I observe that. And I st- and, and then, you know, you start to go to the roller rink in middle school and you go, Oh, I, Oh my God. Like, what am I feeling for Susie? What am I supposed mm-hmm. to do about that? Like, do you think she'll go skating with me? Like, Oh my God, I'm terrified. <laughs> well, you know, all of that is part of this beautiful gradual process. Yeah. And somewhere in there, you have all these bigger questions of, okay, like when do you talk to your kid about masturbation or, or, you know, periods or, or whatever, you know, all the, the whole realm of topics that come up with sexuality. Um, but hopefully that's all being overseen by attentive parents who are watching and they see, you know, what their kids have been engaging in and, and ask gentle questions. And then when the kid, of course, you know, goes, mom, shut up. I don't want to talk about that. You know, <laughs> you know, they, they sort of withdraw and they, they tenderly find entryways into real dialogue with their child. That sounds quite beautiful, quite ideal. Mm-hmm. And I know that for, for some lucky kids, that is how things unfold for lots of other people. That's just not the case. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I wonder you know, if you if you take this program's teachings and you put it into practice in a counseling room between, let's say, a teenage client and their therapist, I just can imagine that wouldn't be so great. I wonder how it might be interesting to talk a little bit about how do we deal with sexuality in the counseling room? Because there's really something complicated about, you know, we're, we're of course, adult therapists and talking with teenagers. Hard. Adult sexuality is very hard. Yeah, it's a really delicate task, and it has to be approached super carefully. And we'll probably have a whole episode about this. But just you know, since we talked about the education of therapists around sexuality, and we all work with young people, mm-hmm. um, I find for me this is just so incredibly sensitive. And th- there is this kind of perspective in the field of counseling in some kind of niches that you just have to ask really directly. And I find with teenagers, this is not just about sexuality with everything. It's always with a very light touch. And so, you know, for me, this is, it's an important part of the work and it's something we tend to circle back around to over and over. Mm -hmm. But I find that trying to approach sexuality with a really heavy hand is hard. And the reason this kind of comes up in the context of gender identity is that a lot of parents are concerned like you know my child has not had any sexual experiences and yet they are claiming that they want to get on hormones or have surgeries and they really don't know much about their own bodies yet so you know can you talk with them about sexuality and it's like well yeah we could try (laughs) but they have their own process too so I don't know this is just a very complicated but important part of the work and I just thought I'd I, I, I'm really glad you raised it. I'm sorry to jump in, but like I really think that the idea of somebody taking hormones before they know what sort of orgasm they like to experience and before they know what sort of sex they want to have and how they want to have it, it just seems kind of anathema to me insofar as you, you first of all have to kind of figure out whether you can get sexual pleasure from your body as it is before you start trying to change it to get sexual pleasure so, somewhere else. Um, I, it does bring to mind that conversation we had with Buck Angel in a different episode. And he did talk about, I think he was on testosterone by then. And he had that very powerful uh, vaginal orgasm or something. Mm-hmm. And that really made him kind of become friendly with his body. And I wondered, I wonder if he'd had that experience 10, 15 years beforehand, mm-hmm. w- would he have become friendly with his body? I, I think we have to kind of bring about some sort of um bridge to getting to know and and I was going to say play with our body but you follow me <laughs> yeah <laughs> kind well, of Simone, yeah, play, I mean, yeah. And that, that yeah. may be more correct than you intended uh yeah it, it, it's hard because it's not just having those experiences with your body but also being able to integrate them because kids can be full of of uh, all kinds of either um instinctive or even compulsive behaviors, but they're totally disconnected from them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't want to know what they're doing or find words for what they're doing. But what they do have is 
mountains of words that they've been fed vocabulary you know they if they if the gender unicorn has been on the wall of every classroom since they were in first grade and and so long before they could really understand these things they've been sort of placing themselves somewhere on the gender spectrum yeah. and then it becomes really hard to get to a genuine first hand response in their own feelings and words about who they are and what they want and what they've experienced and also it's 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 commodified their their situation in so far as um they 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 might have had a developing sexuality but now it's it's so porn shaped that so many of them like they might be having sex but they're watching an awful lot of porn mm-hmm. and there's a huge amount of porn happening in teenage lives and at the same time they're not fumbling with each other they're not touching each other they're not kissing each other nothing like the rate they would have in previous generations Instead, it's this porny, slightly one step removed kind of version of sex. And I really wonder what, I mean, this connects with a broader question that humanity is having thrust upon us right now, which is like, what the hell is the internet doing to us? You know, know. we're we're in this virtual world where we're inundated with everything all the time. And, um, it seems to be making us go kind of haywire. And I think some people who have read my article assume that I'm like anti-porn or anti-BDSM or whatever the case may be, and and I'm not. Um, but I, I do think at least it's, gosh, really important for us to be careful and, and curious and, mm-hmm. and having meaningful conversations about these things and all of their complexity. And, and if you use porn an awful lot, it wrecks your sex life. Like, Let's be straight. It does. You know what I mean? A huge amount of well, that, that was yeah. strongly pushed back against in the program. It's oh, hard really? because oh yeah. Oh, they talk about um how there are just all these organizations that have dubious funding sources that um you know they have an agenda, a religious or political or moral agenda, and they want to make it seem like porn is bad and harmful, but really porn is perfectly good and, and doesn't cause any problems. Can you tell the story of when when a couple comes to you and it's a husband and wife and the wife thinks the husband yeah. has got a porn addiction? Just tell that story. Oh, yeah. yeah, we we were in a class and a, and one of the students asked the professor, um, you know, about a specific situation they were having where a couple came to them and the the presenting problem was that the the husband's use of porn was causing trouble in the relationship. Um, and so, you know, how do you help this person? And the professor's response was that the real problem is the wife's prudish attitude about sex and porn. And so that's what they need to address, which I was just like, not surprised at that point, but also like, wow, you just said that straight up out loud, that it's your job <laughs> as the therapist to correct the moral values of the couple that are coming to you. And so I, I that was a moment in the program where I did speak up and uh, I wasn't trying to be contentious, but I said, Hey, like, you know, I work with a lot of people who are religious and, you know, if I, if, if I said, Hey, what you need to do is just accept that porn is totally okay. And, and that this isn't a problem at all. You just need to become more comfortable with porn. There's a lot of people for whom that would be a non-starter because that just violates their values. So what do you do with that? What would they have said if you'd said, but there's, there's, like there's evidence and it's it's well studied that compulsive and overuse of porn leads to kind of delayed ability to ejaculate and it leads to bad erections if not no erections the, you know what 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 would they say to that they had a whole campaign about that basically saying that's all junk science yeah. didn't they yeah yeah that's all they say it's all junk and you get into one of those difficult conversations that are very common nowadays because it's like our society has broadly accepted that science is the arbiter of truth, but then everybody on all sides is sort of proclaiming science says this. We believe science. The other people are, they don't believe oh, yeah, science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And both sides are saying it. Both sides are citing studies. And It's like in other centuries, God was on our side when we exactly. went to war. And now yeah, it's exactly yeah, the really same. Is. 
Do you not believe in science is the yeah. same thing as like, do you not believe in God? Like it's it the really same is. thing. Oh, I mean, the, the, it's the, not junk science. The I, religious I, parallels are so striking because it's like, I mean, you know, I used to evangelize people and now in the program you're supposed to educate people. That's your job. And you used to want to get people saved and now you want to get them woke. And, oh, jeez. Um, Kamir, can I just ask, it's not junk science. The, 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 well, I've had enough clients to know that there's huge problems with um, with sex lives when one of them, generally the male, has a compulsive use of pornography. There's, that's not junk science. Well, I think at least one argument they would give, uh, an argument they would give is that a lot of the problems that people think are associated with porn use are actually associated with the, the shame individual around. shame and guilt about their porn use. So yeah. if you can just... Um, uh, give them permission and take it, it. Yeah, destigmatize it, then all the problems will go away. And that's really their belief about everything with regard to sexuality. Is right, exactly. Well, everything about everything. It's all about destigmatize. Yeah, and it's the same exact argument about gender dysphoria. Hmm. That's not actually that believing you have the wrong sex body is distressing. It's actually not distressing. What's distressing is the stigma and discrimination against you. And I mean, I agree that discrimination against people who are trans for like housing and jobs or anything like that, anything social, it is harmful. But to say that believing that your body is wrong is inherently not a distressing experience, like how can you make that argument? And so yeah, this is where science can get really muddled because it it is Usually simplistic scientific claims, you zoom in on them, you zoom in on the actual studies, they're way more complicated and way more difficult to interpret than the public conversation tends to acknowledge. But, um, oh gosh, I was just about to say something. Well, I'll come in while you're thinking of it. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I've read and I've had so many clients and I, I, you know, I've really had a lot around this and they've talked about death grip and how that that's a, a serious issue around like basically the penis can't, they can't ejaculate because they've, they've masturbated too often and they've used porn too yeah. much and it's become compulsive. And compulsive behavior is compulsive behavior. I don't care if it's about touching a door handle or whether it's a penis, it's, it's compulsive. <laughs> Uh, it's well established. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to have. I don't think we're arguing with yeah, you, Stella. I <laughs> <laughs> got the same trust. place, but I think that's the problem when when you when you can just say, "Well, it's you know we say a, a lot of stuff about junk science coming from the affirmative camp." So I've used that argument too, but I do think that you guys are lifting up. We have to be able to point to something beyond just what a research paper says. Yeah. You know, we have to be able to say, is there any parameters on what a healthy, well-balanced, meaningful sex life looks like? Do we have any parameters on that? And if we say no, then we end up in, in this kind of hyper expanded definition of like literally any sexual act goes, anything. Mm -hmm including being beaten until you literally pass out. I mean, to me, something is wrong when, well, there's no scientific evidence that that's harmful. Like, well, like, well we're not how do you even define science. harm? That you right. get into these questions of like, yeah. like, well, we can't say, you know, that, um, how do we, you know, we can't say that behavior is unhealthy if it hurts the client because maybe the client wants to hurt. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think you, you kind of were touching on, uh, Sasha, what I, the thought that I was going to have, which is that I think there's th all of this difficulty with interpreting science is part of why it can be really helpful to have some grounding in philosophy. So, because then you can say, recognize, for example, that if the explanation being given is that all the problems that you're experiencing are caused by oppression, you can know rationally, that's a really insufficient explanation. Not all things are that are bad are caused by oppression. Some things are just because life is hard and complicated. And so if you're, if you're fe having a sense of discomfort in your own body, that's going to be difficult, whether you're in an oppressive society or not. And that's not at all to discount the real fact of oppression and prejudice and discrimination and all that. And I, I think as far as I know, this whole oppression and, and the constant fixation of power and oppression 
as far as I can, I'm, I can gather from these kind of um, ideologies, it's really like the only reason children can't um, be sexualized is because of consent. And really, we can bring a sexual life into their lives. As far as I can gather, that would be the ideology, except that they can't consent. And if they could consent, really, it's all systems go. Something like it's that. weird because like except they can like like they can consent with one another you know that's that's allowed and in some ways even encouraged um and there's no sense that like exposing children to highly sexualized content could in itself be harmful mm-hmm. um that's just a conservative myth they don't know how grooming works. Like they've never worked with victims of actual child abuse because that's exactly how it works. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into it, but there's something you know, really, really bizarre about that to me, about this push to expose kids younger and younger to very sexual information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I think this might be a great stopping point, Tim. Um, We really appreciate you coming on and sharing more with us about your experience and your your thoughts on the sexuality education. Of course, aside from the piece, is there anywhere else that people can find you online if they want to kind of learn more about this writing or your work? Not really. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 they don't have you mean you don't doing. have a podcast? No. <laughs> uh, if, if you need a co-host once in a while, you can call me. But uh, no, I, I'm just a normal therapist with a website that people can go to to contact me for therapy. And usually my answer is, I don't have any openings right now. <laughs> <laughs> so the elusive, mysterious Tim. Thank you yeah, so much yeah. for being on. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes. And subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.